is a production of the Berean Call. Catholic doctrines, are they really as evangelical as they claim? You might ask, why examine that? Some people here tonight may think I'm here to attack Catholics. Please do me the credit of not insulting me with that idea, I beg of you. If I did not sincerely from my heart believe that the issue, as our brother has said tonight, is truth, if I were not concerned for the souls of people, I wouldn't be here. I'm not here to attack anybody. I'm not an anti-Catholic. I love Catholics as I love all people. It does bother me a little bit, I must say. For example, I received a letter from a young man recently, and he had written all over the outside of the envelope, Dave Hunt, Catholic basher. So I had mentioned to him that Vatican II, which many people think has changed a great deal, and really hasn't. I mentioned that it contained an anathema. You know what an anathema is? It means excommunicated and eternally damned. He said, I wrote to Carl Keating, I wrote to the experts at Catholic Answers, and they said that Vatican II does not contain any anathemas. <laughs> I wrote back and I said, first of all, and what I will be quoting this evening is not anti-Catholic literature, not even ex-Catholics. The only quotes I would give you from former Catholics would be expressing their own experience as Catholics. But I would not set ex-Catholics up as experts of Catholic doctrine. It doesn't matter what some individual Catholic says is the teaching of the Church. What matters is what the Church itself teaches. So I will only quote from the Council of Trent, and I will explain the Council of Trent to some of you who may not be aware of that. I will quote from the canons and decrees of the Council of Trent, translated by H.J. Schroeder, O.P., published by Tan Books, 1978 edition. I will quote from Vatican Council II, the conciliar and post-conciliar documents, General Editor Austin Flannery, O.P., 1988 revised edition in two volumes, Costello Publishing Company. And I will quote from various catechisms. The Council of Trent, if you're not familiar with it, I'll get back to this anathema that I started talking about. The Council of Trent met from 1545 to 1563. It was comprised of the leading Catholic theologians. They met in response to the Reformation, to the claims of Catholic monks, Catholic priests themselves, who began to see from the Word of God that there were problems with Roman Catholic doctrine. And they were crying out, for example, Sola Scriptura, the Bible is our authority. Sola Fide, we're saved by faith, not by works, and so forth. The Council of Trent met for 18 years. They, it is the most authoritative comp compilation of Roman Catholic doctrine that you can find. They rejected... I want you to understand this, everyone in the audience, Catholic or, or not, and I don't call myself a Protestant. I'm just a, an evangelical believer in the Word of God and a follower of Jesus Christ. The Council of Trent rejected everything, everything. And the canons and decrees of the Council of Trent contain, 
I don't know, there's different counts. Somebody says 131, somebody says 125. I have to go back and count them myself. But at least more than 100 anathemas. That is, anybody who believes what this church believes. See, they're talking about Catholic bashing. They call me a Catholic basher. What about bashing when you anathematize, when you eternally damn anyone who dares to believe something contrary to Roman Catholic teaching? I think that's the pot calling the kettle black. I've never bashed anybody like that. I'm quoting... From volume one, I said, two volume set on the conciliar and post conciliar documents of Vatican II. I'm quoting volume one, page 71. Quote The Church, that is the Roman Catholic Church, teaches and commands that the usage of indulgences should be kept in the Church, and it condemns with anathema those who say that indulgences are useless or that the church does not have the power to grant them. Uh, if you don't believe in indulgences tonight, and we will get to purgatory and indulgences in our first session tomorrow evening, God willing, if you do not believe in indulgences tonight, and just to give you just a little basic explanation of what an indulgence is, the Catholic Church teaches that a treasury of grace has been committed to it as the successors of Peter. And this treasury contains the merits of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Plus into that has been deposited the merits of Mary, plus the merits of the saints, various saints, whose good deeds were beyond what was necessary for their own salvation, and this superfluity, the surplus, has been deposited along with the merits of Christ, the merits of Jesus, and the merits of Mary, have been put into this treasury. And it is from this treasury that the Catholic Church dispenses piecemeal the grace of God. Okay, do you understand that? I see a few people nodding their heads, they're Catholics. And you know that that's true. And an indulgence is something that you gain, you merit, by saying so many rosaries or, or maybe reading some scripture, whatever it may be. And that knocks off so much time in purgatory for you. Now, if you are anyone here tonight, and I don't believe that, I don't find it in the Word of God, and that has to be my authority, but if you are here tonight and you do not accept this as valid teaching from the Word of God, you are anathematized by Vatican II as well as by the Council of Trent. And by the way, Vatican II said that this council confirms all of the canons and the decrees of the Council of Trent. Therefore, Vatican II contains all of the anathema, uh, anathemas in Trent, as well as what it has added itself. So please, don't call me a Catholic basher, because I have not anathematized any Catholics. But Catholics have anathematized me. Let's turn to the Word of God. Jude, that little tiny epistle of Jude. Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called. To be sanctified means that you're set apart by God for His purpose. It means that you're a saint. You should be holy and live a holy life. You realize, of course, just hold your finger there and turn to 1 Corinthians, which is just one of the places we'll turn to. 
And if you're not familiar with this fact, let me call it to your attention this evening. Verse 1 of 1 Corinthians chapter 1, Paul, called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God, and Sosthenes, our brother, unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus. That's, that, those are the ones that Jude is addressing. Sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints. Called saints. All of the epistles, the epistle to the Ephesians was written to the saints at Ephesus. The epistle to the Galatians was written to the saints at Galatia. A saint is not somebody who was voted in by the Congress of Cardinals 300 years after they died. A saint is a living follower of Jesus Christ who has been sanctified and set apart by God for his purpose and who lives a holy life in obedience to his Lord because he's been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, he's crucified with Christ, and Christ has come to live in him. So now, going back to Jude, I will come back to 1 Corinthians. He says in verse 3, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith, which was once, once for all really, delivered unto the saints. If you are a Christian here tonight, that's one of the problems in Roman Catholicism. We're going to talk about the distinctives and the dangers this evening. Roman Catholicism, distinctives and dangers. One of the distinctions between the Catholics and evangelical Christians, and I don't want to use the term Protestants, is that they believe that there is a hierarchy, the magisterium, the bishops. There is a special class of people to whom is committed this trust of guarding this gospel and teaching it and preaching it. No, the Bible says every one of you here tonight, if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, if you have personally received him as your Lord and Savior, you know him. You have the awesome responsibility before God of guarding this gospel, keeping it pure, unperverted, uncorrupted, that's your responsibility, not some priest class, not some councils, but that is the responsibility of every one of you to live a pure life that will commend him, commend the gospel. This epistle is not written to the bishops. That's the point I'm trying to get across to begin with. See, the Roman Catholic Church looks at the Bible much differently from the way we look at the Bible. Vatican II says very clearly, and I'm getting ahead of myself in my little introduction here, but Vatican II says very clearly that it is the magisterium who alone can interpret the Word of God. I don't believe that. We're going to come back to that in a moment. Let's go, let's go to 1 Corinthians now. Verse 1 again, chapter 1. Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God. Sosthenes, our brother, unto the church of God, which is at Corinth. It's not written to the magisterium. The epistles of Paul were not written to, to one of them was written to Rome, but they're not written to a headquarters. They're not written to a, a group of bishops who are to guard the faith. They are written to the faithful. They're written to the followers of Jesus Christ. That's a big distinction between Catholicism and evangelical teaching, and what I believe is the teaching of the Word of God. Notice what he says. Verse 18. Well, verse 17. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. They're not only Catholics... But there are some so-called Protestants who believe in baptismal regeneration. They believe that unless you are baptized, you're not saved. And we'll get into that uh, in our next session this evening when we talk about the gospel. 
Paul distinguishes between the gospel that saves and baptism. Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. What is the gospel? Romans 1.16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes it. How are you going to get saved? The Philippian jailer cries out, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Period. That's it. That's the gospel. What is the gospel? 1 Corinthians 15, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. That's the gospel. It's that simple. He says, he sent me not to preach the gospel, not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of non-effect. Verse 18, for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. Saved is not some term that the evangelicals lately invented. People kind of poo-poo this idea of being saved. The Council of Trent said, if you dare to say that you are saved, a finished transaction, and you know with absolute certainty that, as Jesus said in John 5, 24, that you have passed from death to life and will not come into condemnation. If you dare to say that you know that with certainty, anathema upon you. Paul counted himself among the saved. He said, I'm saved. And, and he, it, it wasn't just a group of bishops. It wasn't just a group of, of, of leaders. It's all of the saints. And he said, those of us, the preaching of the cross is foolishness to those who perish, but to those of us who are saved. So there are people who are perishing. And there are others who are saved and know they're saved. It's a completed transaction. They have the assurance of eternal life. To those of us who are saved, he counted himself among the saved. It's the power of God. Verse 21. For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. How do you get saved? You get saved by believing what is preached. I go around preaching the gospel, Paul said. I'm not ashamed of it because that's the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. And that's what I'm preaching. It's the power of God. Verse 24, But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. You see your calling, brethren, how there are not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God has chosen not the bishops, not great academic scholars, not somebody who spent so many years in a seminary. I'm sorry, you know, and I'm not uh, opposing you if you want to go to seminary. But he has chosen the foolish things to confound the wise. He's chosen the weak things to confound the mighty. That no flesh should glory. It's God's power working in us. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, you know Paul says, we have this treasury in earthen vessels. We're just earthen vessels. That the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. Verse 30, but of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us. Unto us. Who is us? Again, not a council. Not a group of bishops, not a hierarchy, not a magisterium. If I can just hammer that point home. But every one of us who knows Christ, by God he is made unto us. Christ is made unto us. Wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. Now in contrast to that, the Roman Catholic Church says, no, it is in the church that you have salvation. And it is through the ministration of the seven sacraments. This grace flows into this treasury and the church dispenses it as she will. And you, Jesus said, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. I will give you rest. In John 5, he said to the rabbis in his day, You search the scriptures because in there you think you have life. But these are they that testify of me. And you won't come to me that you might have life. Jesus says, come to me. 
The Catholic Church says, wait a minute. No, no. Jesus is back here. We're his representative. You come to us. And through us, you will receive the grace that flows from Calvary or whatever. There's a distinction. Let me just turn you to a couple of... Well, let's go on to chapter 2. Paul says... Verse 2, I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. He didn't say, I'm here representing the Pope. I'm here representing the Congress of Cardinals. I'm here representing a headquarters somewhere. There was no such thing. I'm here representing Jesus Christ. My speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor the princes of this world that come to naught, but we speak the wisdom of God in the mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory. Verse 10. Well, verse 9. As it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us. Who is this us? Paul is not. I'm, I'm sorry if I keep repeating myself. But you have to understand that the Roman Catholic Church teaches that you do not have the right to read this book and know what it says. The magisterium alone, to them has been committed this. I get letters from so many former Catholics, letters that come by the hundreds. And I don't know if I, if I have a, a typical one here uh, somewhere. Well, here's a, a P.S., now, your, your experience as a Catholic may have been different, but I can tell you I get hundreds of letters just like this. In all my years in Catholic schools, I never remember seeing a Bible in a classroom, not even once. In fact, we were told only a priest could interpret the Scriptures. We would surely make a mistake and not be able to understand it. And have you noticed that there are no concordances in the back of the Catholic Bibles? That makes it next to impossible to find anything you're looking for and so forth. I had a letter recently from a woman. She said, I was 52 years old. I was raised in Catholic schools. I was a devout Catholic all my life. And I was 52 years old before I really took the Bible up and began to read it for myself. And when I did, I saw that what it taught was contrary to what I had been taught all those years. Why? Why? Well, on the one hand, Vatican II does command, and there is a movement in the Catholic Church telling people to read the Bible. On the other hand, what is the point? And I, I think I said to Carl Keating when I debated him, you know, Carl, you really shouldn't be debating me, because <laughs> you don't have the right to interpret. <laughs> in fact, in his book, Carl Keating says, you couldn't know that this book is the Bible. It couldn't speak to your heart, except that there is an infallible church that tells you it's God's Word. Wait a minute. The Word of God has no power. The Bible itself says the Word of God is living and powerful, sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing of soul and spirit, the joints and marrow. It is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart, and no one is hidden from its sight. The Word of God carries its own conviction. I don't have to go to a church that will tell me that this is God's Word. But they will tell you, and we'll come back to it in a few moments, they will tell you, and, and, and I try, as I debated Jerry Matatix, uh, Keith Fournier recently, I tried to understand what they were saying. They were saying that this church gave us the Bible. And if this church is not infallible, then we can't trust the book it gave us. Did the church give us the Bible? No, the church did not give us the Bible. First of all, the church surely did not give us the Old Testament, right? The church wasn't even here when the Old Testament was written. And if you go back and you read Deuteronomy 8, you will find the verse that Jesus quoted in the temptation when he was tempted of Satan in the wilderness. And it was from Deuteronomy 8 that Jesus quoted this. 
Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God shall man live. There was no church around to tell him this was God's word. God's word is life producing. It bears the stamp of God. It's inspired by his spirit and it speaks to every heart that is open to him. You know, Jesus was asked in John 7, Well, how do we know that what you're teaching is, is true? How do we know that you're teaching the right doctrines? You didn't go to any of the rabbis' schools. Who am I, people say. I mean, people often say that to me. You don't have a seminary degree. I mean, how can you run around teaching from the Word of God and, and questioning these great people? I have a very simple response. The Bereans didn't have a seminary degree either. Acts 17.11, it says, Those in Berea were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they searched the Scriptures daily to see whether what Paul was teaching was true. And if they were commended for searching the Scriptures to see what Paul was teaching was true, then you better search the Scriptures to see whether what John Paul II is teaching is true. And you would be commended by God for doing so. You have a moral responsibility to God to know His Word. God's Word speaks. I remember, you're not old enough to remember the martyrs, the five martyrs of the Alca Indians way back there in Ecuador. Three of them were very dear friends of mine. Our, my eldest son was born about the time that Ed and Mary Lou McCulley's first son was born. We named our, our second son after Ed, one of the martyrs. I remember asking Jim Elliott, the brother of, uh, I'm sorry, Bert Elliott, the brother of Jim, whose wife, Betty, we called her, Elizabeth Elliott, wrote that book, Through Gates of Splendor. I remember being there. My wife and I were the only non-family members that Sunday afternoon as Mary Lou sat down at the piano and played that song I had never heard before, which became part of the title of the book. We rest on thee, our shield and our defender. We go not forth alone to meet the foe. Strong in thy strength, safe in thy keeping tender. We rest on thee, and in thy name we go. And they were killed by the Alka Indians. And you know what came out of that. And I remember asking Bert, Jim's brother, and who also is a missionary in the jungles of Peru, has planted many fellowships down there. I said, Bert, when you go back into the jungle and you preach to the natives from God's Word, why, what would cause them to believe it? <laughs> because it's like a book they've never seen, it's leather bound, it's very thin India paper, and, or, or, or why would they believe it? He said, because this is God's word and it speaks to the heart of man. And the Holy Spirit will convict him. Jesus said it in John 16. When he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will convince the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment to come. Don't tell me that the Holy Spirit, who can convince the world of sin, of righteousness, and judgment to come, cannot lead the believer in Christ to know that this is his word, and to teach him, and to bring life to him from this book, without having it endorsed by some magisterium. It was not until 397 A.D., the Council of Hippo, that a Congress gave you the first declaration on the canon of the New Testament. You mean to say that until then, almost four centuries, nobody could use this book because they had no official declaration of a council? I want to stand in the same relationship to this book as those early Christians stood before any council ever said, this is the canon of Scripture. Well, how did they know it was the canon of Scripture? It had been accepted long since 
via a consensus of the believers in Jesus Christ. Jesus said in John 10, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 14, If any man among you thinketh himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge on that basis, on the basis of the leading of the Holy Spirit within, let him acknowledge that the things that I write are the commandments of God. How did the church know that the canon of the, the New Testament books were authentic? Because they bore witness in their hearts by the Holy Spirit. And there was a common consensus of believers who were quoting it. The Council of Nicaea in 325 A.D. argued from this book. Argued and quoted from the New Testament. And no council had, ever, had, had yet uh, officially declared that... Uh, this was; these were the canonized books of the Bible, and in John seven, I think I started to to quote a few minutes ago when Jesus was asked, "How do we know that what you're teaching is of God?" John seven seventeen. If you're looking it up, you didn't go to the rabbinical schools. Jesus said, if one of the most important verses in the Bible, although they're all important, if any man wills to do God's will, he will know. It doesn't say if the magisterium endorses it. It doesn't say if some infallible church says this is God's word. It says if you want to know and do God's will, you will know, he says, you will know the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. That's a basic difference is the view of Scripture. Let me just give you a couple of other verses, although there are lots of them, and I see I'm going to run out of time and I haven't even got started to what I wanted to say. So let's go to uh, Luke 8, and verse 21. Let's read from verse 19. Then came to him his mother and his brethren. Now the Catholics say it doesn't mean brothers, it means cousins. Well, I believe it was brothers. It clearly says that Joseph, Matthew, took Mary as his wife and knew her not until... She gave birth to her firstborn son. I think that language is quite clear, and you're going to have to twist it to maintain your position. And I don't see why Mary had to continue to be a virgin, but that's not my topic tonight. We get to that the last night, the last session. Then came to him his mother and his brethren, and could not come at him for the press. So many people. And it was told him by certain which said, Thy mother and thy brethren stand without desiring to see thee. And he answered and said unto them, Wow, if it's my mother, I'll certainly do whatever she says. Listen to what he said. My mother and my brethren are these which hear the word of God and do it. How could you hear the word of God and do it if the magisterium hasn't yet told you that it's inspired? The council of Hippo hasn't met. It's almost, it's 360, 70 years yet. They haven't met to tell you what's in the canon. And Jesus says, my mother and my brethren are those that hear the word of God and do it. Wow, read Psalm 19. I, we just have to turn to it. I'm sorry. Well, think of Psalm 1. How does it begin? Blessed, well, we just quote it while we're trying to find Psalm 19. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, what? And in his law doth he meditate day and night. How could, how could the psalmist way back there meditate on the word of God? The church in Rome hadn't yet told him that it was the word of God. Jesus, in, I mean, just one scripture brings another. I'm just going to have to stop quoting a barrage of scriptures. Jesus, in, in Luke 24, you remember, when he was walking with the two on the road to Emmaus before he revealed himself to them. 
It says, beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the what? In all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. He quoted the Scriptures. Paul quoted the Scriptures. Acts 17, you'll read that Paul went into the synagogue. He said it was his custom. And he took the Scriptures and he opened them. And he taught them from them. And he said, look what it says would happen to the Messiah. And it happened to Jesus. It was fulfilled in him. Therefore, Jesus is the Messiah. He reasoned from the Word of God before there was any magisterium around, before there was any infallible truth church, if that's what it is, and we'll discuss that later, to tell him, to tell them it was the Word of God. But notice what David says. Verse 7, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. How can it convert the soul? The church hasn't yet declared it to be capable of converting the soul. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. How can can the heart rejoice in it? The magisterium hasn't yet given its endorsement. The commandments of the Lord are pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is thy servant warned, and in keeping of them there is great reward. Psalm 119, we won't take time to turn to it. I want to go back to Luke. But what does he say there? Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. Yes, the word of God, without any magisterium, without any infallible church, without anybody in Rome, without a pope, without any councils, to say, this is the authentic word of God. That book will cleanse the way of a young man who will give heed to it. He doesn't have to be a seminary graduate. He doesn't have to be a priest. A young man. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. Just uh, go to Luke 11 and verse 28. It's a a different situation, but it's very similar. Verse 27, Luke 11, 27. And it came to pass... As he spake these things, a certain woman of the company lifted up her voice and said unto him, Blessed is the womb that bare thee, and the paps which thou hast sucked. But he said, Yea, rather. Now, the Catholic says, and again, I'm getting ahead of myself, because, but this is the main thing I wanted to read it for. The Catholic says, You don't honor Mary enough. I say the Catholics honor her too much. We honor her as the mother of our Lord. But but notice what Jesus said. Someone says, Blessed is she. Yes, all women will call her blessed. But Jesus says, Yea, rather, blessed are they that hear the word of God and keep it. And again, the point that I'm trying to make is, how could they hear the word of God? How could they know it was the word of God when Vatican II says it is only the magisterium that can make that declaration? That pronouncement. And they say the church gave us the Bible. No, the church didn't give us the Bible. The Bible corrects the church. Most of the epistles were written to correct the church. Now, why is this topic of concern? Well, it's of great concern because, as we'll see in, in the next hour, we'll begin, I think, in Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 and 7. Where Paul said, Though I or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. Now there's an anathema. An anathema from the pen of Paul against anyone who dares to preach another gospel. And I think we'll see in the next hour that Roman Catholicism is indeed another gospel. What was Paul concerned about? That's one of the things that's very confusing. We'll come back to this probably again and again because it's very difficult to get the point across. He was concerned about the Judaizers, we call them. Who were the Judaizers? 
Did they deny the virgin birth? No, they affirmed it. Did they deny that God uh, existed eternally in three persons? No, they affirmed it. Did they deny that Jesus, the Son of God, came, born of a virgin, died upon the cross for our sins, and rose again the thir third day? No, they affirmed it. They affirmed all of that, and so does the Catholic Church. Then what was wrong with what they taught? They said that in addition to simple faith in the finished work of Christ, you must be circumcised and keep the law or you won't get to heaven. And Paul said that lie turns all the truth that they, that they profess, it turns it into a fraud, into a false gospel that will not save but will damn. I'm concerned from my heart. I believe that we must earnestly contend for the faith. And I believe that not only among Catholics, and if there are any Catholics here tonight, uh, you're not familiar with my books, but there are others here who could tell you that I've had far more to say about people within the so-called Protestant churches of their false teachings. So it's not that I'm just picking out Catholics. I don't care who it is. And look, if you will correct me from God's Word, I wouldn't consider it an attack. I would consider it a kindness. Because I don't want to go on in error. And I would hope that if you're here tonight and I reason with you from the Word of God, and if you can't refute, refute what the Bible says, then you ought to bring your beliefs in line with what this book says. You have a moral responsibility. I don't want to be anybody's guru, you know. One day you're going to stand before the Lord. I will, you will. And when God says, why did you do this? Why did you believe that? And you say, well, Dave Hunt, you know, he was bald like Elijah and he had a beard. And, and, uh, and he came, you know, from a great distance and a, with a briefcase. And, a, you know, and that made him very authoritative. And he said this, and so I believed it. God will say, wait a minute. I've given you a conscience. I've given you some common sense. I've given you my word. I've given you the leading of the Holy Spirit. And you are morally accountable, and you can't push that off on anybody else. And when you stand before God, and you say, "Why?" Did, he says, why did you do it? And you say, well, the magisterium said so. The Roman Catholic Church said so. He will say the same thing to you. You are morally accountable yourself, and you can't put that off on somebody else. You are called to obey God, not men. Even those who claim to be his representatives, if they clearly... Do not teach according to this word. That you are morally accountable to God. And I would solemnly remind you of that this evening. Yea, rather, blessed are they that hear the word of God and keep it. I'm concerned because I believe that there is false teaching out there. I'm concerned because I think that Catholicism is going to become a great issue. Why do I think it will become a great issue? Because... There's an ecumenical movement, first of all. I just got Chuck Colson's latest newsletter, and I think Chuck Colson is a man of God. I've had some correspondence with him about this, and I don't fathom it. He wrote the foreword to Keith Fournier's book, Evangelical Catholics. And the title of it is, it just came yesterday, maybe some of you received it, All for One and One for All. He says, all of our tracts and crusades and revivals are for naught if we ignore the prerequisite to evangelism, our oneness in Christ. Jesus put it plainly, I pray that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I in you. May they also be in us, one in us, that the world may believe that you have sent me. How well are we living out the reality of Christ's prayer? Even as we hold conferences on evangelism, ministers deride one another. Well, Please, Chuck, I have never derided anybody. Out of love and concern, I have tried to point out where some people I don't think are following the Word of God, and I would consider, they, they should consider it a kindness. Jesus said, people talk about love. Let's just love one another. Jesus said, as you know, in, in, Re, in the book of Revelation, in his letters to one, to one of the seven churches, he said, As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. If you love someone, sincerely love someone, you will want to tell them the truth. You go to a medical doctor, you've got a ruptured appendix, and if you're not on that operating table within 30 minutes, you're dead. But he wouldn't want to upset you. 
<laughs> by telling you the truth. So he says, well, everything's okay. The glow of 105 degree fever in your cheeks is the glow of health. And if you feel a little pain, take an aspirin. I mean, let's be united. You go to a doctor and he examines you and you say, Doc, what's the diagnosis and the prognosis? And he says, well, uh, what would you like? You know, open heart surgery has been very popular lately or I could transplant a kidney. I think everybody is entitled to the operation of his choice. You hear people say that all the time. Everybody's entitled to the religion of his choice. Indeed, you are. And you're entitled to the operation of your choice. And no uh, ethical doctor would force on you an operation against your will. But I would pray that you would go to a doctor who would make an accurate diagnosis and who would prescribe a remedy that would meet your malady. That's the question. And the malady is sin. It's in all of our hearts. And God has a remedy. And we dare not change what he has said. Because then it's not going to meet our need. He goes on, you know, talking about unity. If we're unified around a false hope, if we're unified around error, that's not going to help, is it? We must be unified in the truth. And the Bible says, speaking the truth in love. He says, even as we hold conferences on evangelism, ministers, ministers, ministers that deride one another, some Catholics and Protestants still fight long settled Reformation era battles. Chuck, I'm going to write to you. I'm going to call you on the phone if I can reach you. Now, I want to know what Reformation era battles have been settled long ago. See, that's the problem today. There were about a million people burned at the stake, and I'm not going to go into that. People will say, well, yeah, there were Protestants who burned Protestants, Protestants burned Catholics, and so forth and so on. Well, whoever burned whom? Those who were burned were willing to die for what they believe, and those who burned them thought it was so important that they put them to death. Now, don't tell me you can just sweep that under the rug as though it never happened. There are issues that were involved in the Reformation, and I don't think most so-called Protestants even know what they are. And if you think Vatican II changed it, it did not. It only reconfirmed Trent. It says so in its own language. So I'd like to know what fight, what, long, what Protestant era battles were long ago settled. They weren't. Now, are these issues alive today? Were they worth dying for then? Or are we going to just say the whole thing was a semantic misunderstanding? That's an insult to the martyrs. And it's an insult to those who burned them, who felt they were doing God's will. We have this idea. Here's just an article, 40,000 Gather New Orleans. This is uh, back in 87. In Christian Unity for Evangelization. There were about half of them there were Roman Catholics. Robert Schuller says, I'm not going to join the NRB, National Religious Broadcasters, until they will admit Catholics and Seventh-day Adventists as Christians. Billy Graham praises the Pope. Here's uh, the St. Louis Review. Uh, begins with this heading across the page. July 12, 1991. Catholics hope crusade finds lapsed members. And the article goes on to refer to the upcoming Billy Graham crusade, September 25th through 29th last year, which was co-sponsored by the Archdiocese of St. Louis. And it says this is the greatest opportunity to get Catholics back into the church, lapsed Catholics back into the church. Here's a woman writes to me, very concerned. She says, Dear Dave, I wonder if you could tell me why every time I turn on the so-called Christian station in this vicinity, and I won't tell you which one it was, I get so many Catholic programs. I'm not Catholic, so I turn it off. They have their own channel. And now, Miss Sterney, she names this person, um, is turning this channel into a Catholic channel. I expect any day to hear him saying his rosary. And she goes on, complaining. There is a joining together, supposedly, in love. 
My publisher received this letter. Charismatic Christian Bookstore. I won't tell you in what town, but that's the name of it. We received our floor display of Dave Hunt's new book, Whatever Happened to Heaven. So you know this was in 89. And we're very disappointed in it. We were expecting a dissertation on heaven, but we received instead Mr. Hunt's personal anti-Catholic biases. We have many Catholic charismatic customers who would find this book highly offensive, therefore we'd like to send it back and so forth. I wrote to that bookstore. In all sincerity, please at least give me credit. You may think that I'm dead wrong, but don't call me a Catholic hater or a Catholic basher. At least give me credit for being sincere. And I wrote to that bookstore in all sincerity, and I said, if you can point out one thing in that book that is not 100% factual, accurate to history, accurate to the Word of God, that represents what you call my anti-Catholic biases, please point it out to me, and I promise I will publicly repent, and I will see that that is changed in the next edition of that book. But, I said, if that book contains truth that your customers ought to know and you are keeping it from them, you will be held accountable by God for their souls. Now, that's how strongly I feel about this. I believe the issue is eternity. The issue is God's truth. The issue is the eternal destiny of souls. And that concerns me a great deal. At the same time that there is this ecumenical uh, movement going on, and the Catholic Church is reaching out to embrace its separated brethren, there is also a campaign. This is the Seattle Times, Pope warns against sex. Pope John Paul II urged Catholics yesterday not to be seduced by Protestant fundamentalist sex. I mean, I have all kinds of articles like this. Bishops decry fundamentalist simplicities. Uh, the nation's Washington, D.C., the nation's Roman Catholic bishops, acknowledging fundamentalist Protestant inroads into their constituency, have called for new efforts to counteract the simplicities of biblical fundamentalism. Los Angeles Times... No forgiveness directly from God, Pope says. Rebutting a belief widely shared by Protestants and a growing number of Roman Catholics, Pope John Paul II on Tuesday dismissed the widespread idea that one can obtain forgiveness directly from God and exhorted Catholics to confess more often to their priests and so forth. There's a battle going on. Carl Keating has a crusade. He's taking the battle to Protestants. He's taking the battle to evangelical churches. There are conferences going on. There are books that are being published that are saying, we really believe the same thing. We're going to examine exactly what is believed uh, in, our, in our next hour. But let me just try to, wow, say what I wanted to say here. The few things I'd like to say about the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church, as I think you all know, one thing we can certainly all agree upon is the largest church in the world by far. If by church we mean institution. Now, if by church you mean all true believers, whether they're called Protestants or Catholics, whether they're called Baptists or Methodists or Presbyterians or what, then it's not the largest. But if you mean a visible institution that represents itself as the true Christian church, then it is by far the largest. Now, the, the statistics vary between 800 million to 900, I've seen as high as 950 million. By comparison, Southern Baptists about 15 million. Lutherans about 62 million. It's like a, you know, a, a gnat on an elephant's back. It's the wealthiest and most powerful institution, religious or secular. Just its size makes that likely. But the Pope, John Paul II, is the most powerful, influential leader on earth today, secular or religious. Bush and Gorbachev, well, Gorbachev is out now, but don't count him out. He just became a millionaire the other day. I suppose you saw the news. And the Pope, John Paul II, just said that 
East and Western Europe are not coming together fast enough. They need a new institution to head this up, to, to take care of this, to be headed up by Gorbachev. Gorbachev, I suppose you read, he, you know he has a syndicated column, New York Times, Denver Post, and so forth. He recently said, nothing, none of these historic events that transpired in Eastern Europe, none of them, the wall coming down, the collapse of communism, and so forth, none of it would have been possible without the Pope. I suppose you saw this magical moment. Oh, no, that was Al in Alberville, sorry. That was the top here. That was the Olympics. How Reagan... <laughs> That got a little play up there, but the big thing is Holy Alliance. How Reagan and the Pope conspired to assist Poland's solidarity movement and hasten the demise of communism. And the feature article was all about how Reagan had to appeal to the Pope to accomplish what the CIA wanted to accomplish and so forth. He is, without doubt, the most powerful person on this earth, consulted by the heads of state. We have an ambassador there at the Vatican. We'll come back to that in our last talk. It's the oldest Christian church. Now, Catholics think this makes it right. I mean, if it's the biggest and the oldest, it must be right. On the contrary, it's more likely to being the opposite. Christianity in Paul's day was already perverted. Paul, in his epistles, said, All they in Asia have forsaken me. He called the elders from Ephesus to my lead them there in Acts 20. And he said, I know that after my departing, grievous woes will enter in, not sparing the flock. Also, of your own selves will men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Already in Paul's day. See, one of the things, and I noticed that there are a number of very bright Young evangelicals, Jerry Metanix, Scott Hahn, uh, and, and others would be among them, who are coming back to the Catholic Church because of this argument, the argument from history. It impresses intellectuals, academicians, very much. Why, when we go back and we read Ignatius of Antioch, we read Polycarp, we read the early church fathers, we find they believed in the real presence. They believed in the perpetual virginity. They believed in this and they believed in that. They were very Catholic. Therefore, that must be the true faith. Wait a minute. In Paul's day, he had to write every epistle that he wrote was what? To correct error that was already in the church. He said to the Ephesian elders, listen to it again, from among your own selves shall men arise speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. If already in Paul's day they were perverted, I don't care if this person knew John the Apostle or if he knew someone who knew Peter or if he was, as they would claim, that Ignatius of Antioch was the successor to Peter and so forth. That is immaterial. The question is, what does this book say? Because already in Paul's day, there were those who were high up in the church who were perverting and corrupting the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's why Jude wrote that you must earnestly continue for this. The argument of history doesn't impress me. Tradition. The Catholic Church says we have tradition. I was having a debate with Malachi Martin. Some of you may know some of his books. The latest is To the Keys of This Blood. And he's a former Jesuit and he's very much a Catholic. He's very concerned about the departure of the Catholic Church from what he considers to be the true faith, the true traditions. I said Malachi you don't just go by the Bible, do you? He said, of course we don't. <laughs> we have 1,500 years of tradition. We have the canons and decrees of the councils. We don't just go by the Bible. I said, Malachi, let me tell you about your tradition. Not that he didn't know, but I wanted the audience to know. I said, Malachi, you remember back there in 1322 when Our Lady of Mount Carmel appeared to Pope John XXII and gave him what's known as the Sabbatine privilege. She promised that all those who died wearing her scapular, she would personally go into purgatory the Saturday after their death and take them out to heaven. Now I said, Malachi, you don't believe that, do you? I mean, you couldn't get any farther from the gospel of Jesus Christ than that. He said, I sure do. I wear the scapular. Tradition. But I challenge any Catholic 
to trace any tradition that they have today back to Paul, back to Peter, and show me historically that the tradition that you practice today, yes, Paul talked about the tradition, whether you've received it by word of my epistle or by tradition, taught by word of mouth, honor that. But I challenge you to trace it back and prove to me that this tradition that you have today was taught by the apostles. You can't. I believe that all that they taught verbally was eventually put into this book, all that God wanted us to have. And if it doesn't agree with the Word of God, to the law and to the testimony, Isaiah 8.20, if they speak not according to this Word, there's no light in them. But you cannot be, if you're a Catholic tonight, you cannot be a Berean. You cannot do what the Bereans did. They searched the Scriptures to see whether what Paul was teaching was true. You cannot do that. You cannot challenge your church. You cannot challenge the teachings of the priest or or the bishop or the pope on the basis of this book. But you must accept what the magisterium says, or you are anathematized. This book has lost its power. Tradition holds sway over the Word of God. What the Reformation sought to do was to replace a church that claimed to be infallible with infallible scriptures. This becomes the authority, not the interpretation of of certain men. Paul referred favorably to tradition, 2 Thessalonians 2.15 and 3.16. But Jesus rebuked the religious leaders of his day. Remember what he said? In Matthew 15 and in Mark 7, 8, and 9, Jesus said, You have by your tradition made void the Word of God. You have contradicted the Word of God by your tradition. And Peter, whom the Catholics claim was the first pope, in 1 Peter 1, 18, he speaks unfavorably of the tradition which they received from their fathers. He says, you've been redeemed, not with corruptible things, such as silver and gold, but with incorruptible the word of God that liveth and abideth forever, and it has rescued you from this vain conversation that you receive by tradition from your fathers. It claims to be infallible, and we'll come back to that when we deal with uh, the infallibility of the Pope, who are the successors of Peter, and so forth. Catholics are encouraged to read the word of God. Someone who had been a Catholic for a long time and turned to the Lord in simple faith, trusting Him, sent me a huge red leather-bound Catholic Bible. And I'm going to come back to that and give you some quotes out of the Bible itself. But in the front of the Bible, I saw this. Indulgences for reading the Bible. You know what an indulgence is. We have a little problem. We'll come back to it when we get to purgatory. But the teaching of purgatory is that you can't just have righteousness imputed to you through the death of Christ, but you must be made righteous through personally suffering and being purged. My Bible says all things are purged by blood. It's through the blood of Christ that we're purged. Suffering in purgatory isn't going to purge anybody. So you must, but the teaching of indulgences contradicts, if you're a Catholic, just think about this tonight. It contradicts the teaching of purgatory. Because purgatory is that you must personally be purged by suffering for your sins, either in this life or in purgatory. But you can get an indulgence that mitigates, that takes away that suffering. For example... To the faithful who read the books of sacred scripture for at least a quarter of an hour with the great reverence due to the divine word and after the manner of spiritual reading, an indulgence of three years is granted. Now, you know, that's one thing that was changed in Vatican II. They have about 20 complex paragraphs on indulgences. And one of the things that Vatican II says, we can't say how many years can be knocked off anymore. I used to ask Catholics, how long do you have to spend in purgatory? You don't know. That's one of the problems. When is enough enough? When are enough masses said? When are enough rosaries said? When have you gotten enough indulgences? How many years must you get till finally you're delivered from this thing? You don't know because you don't know how long you've got to be there and the church can't tell you. Even the Pope doesn't know for himself. So it's uncertain. But here knocks off three years. For every quarter of an hour you read the Bible. 
But notice this, to the faithful who piously read at least some verses of the gospel, and in addition, while kissing the gospel book, my Bible doesn't tell me I should kiss it. What is that? That's not this thing, this physical thing. I kiss it. It's what it says. God speaks to me through this. While kissing the gospel book and devoutly recite one of the following invocations, quote, and this kind of leads into our next hour. Is it another gospel? As you kiss the book, you quote this. May our sins be blotted out by virtue of the words of the gospel. No, your sins will not be blotted out by virtue of the words of the gospel. Just reading them is not going to save you. You must meet Christ in your heart. You must personally know him. You must believe. It's like the, you know the story. My dad came from England. And the great hero in England way back at the turn of the century was Blondin, the tightrope walker. You remember? The greatest tightrope walker the world has ever seen. He stretched a cable across the Niagara Falls and he walked across and he went out there and sat on a chair and cooked his meal and ate it out there. He carried men on his back across there and the gamblers bet against him. And they cut the guy wires when he was out in the middle with a man on his back in this. And the wire sagged, began to sway in the wind. And the man on his back was seasick and vomiting. Blondin made it to the other side. He was the greatest. And an older gentleman like myself was conversing with a younger man on what it means to have faith in Christ, to personally know Christ. Not just reading about him. Not just reciting the words. And he said, what do you think of Blondin? Oh, he said, he's the greatest. You think he can carry a man on his back? Of course, I've seen him do it many times. Well, he's coming back in a minute, and he's going to ask for a volunteer. Will you be the man? Ooh, no. We can with our lips say Christ died for our sins. We can affirm all of the gospel, but are you willing to trust your eternal soul, your eternal destiny, solely in the finished work of Jesus Christ? Without any endorsement from a magisterium, without all the ritual, the sacraments, anything else, but are you willing to respond when he said, come unto me, and will you trust him? And will you be the one who gets upon his back and lets him carry you across? That's the difference. You're supposed to kiss the book. May our sins be blotted out by virtue of the words of the gospel. May the reading of the gospel be our salvation and protection. No, I'm sorry. People can read it and read it and read it. I was raised in a home where we had family devotions twice a day, and I thank God for my parents. I could quote entire chapters of the Bible without ever having tried to memorize it before I was old enough to go to school. I just heard it so often. I could say it. I believe Christ died for my sins even. But until that day, just before the summer, before I entered high school, when I personally put my faith in Him and I committed myself to Him for eternity, I made it personal, not just reading the words of the gospel. That's when I was born again, born of the Spirit of God, and everything changed in my life. A plenary indulgence is granted at the hour of death to those who have often during life performed this pious exercise, and having confessed and received communion, or at least having sorrow for their sins, they invoke the most holy name of Jesus on their lips, if possible, or at least in their hearts, and accept death from the hand of God as the price of sin. No, your death is not going to pay for your sin. Yes, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You can't pay for a gift. You can't earn a gift. You can't merit it. We have to receive it from Him. There are some distinctions between what evangelicals believe, some serious distinctions, and what Roman Catholics believe. And I've just mentioned them with regard to the church. The church is a visible institution that is infallible, that has come down, that has given us this book, and it has traditions, and it can make declarations, and it alone can decide what this book means. And you must come to this church, we'll quote in the next hour, both from Trent and from Vatican II, and Catholics will deny some of them. It says the church is essential to salvation. It's like Mormonism. The very first thing, you know the first thing a Mormon is going to try to teach you, the two Mormon missionaries when they come to your door? 
They will try to teach you that there is one true church, the Mormon church, outside of which there is no salvation. And salvation comes through obeying this church and following its rituals in the temple. Exactly what Roman Catholicism teaches. There is one true church. Outside of this church, its doctrines, there is no salvation. If you pardon me one more illustration. It's uh, supposing that uh, the pastor here, uh, Brother Gill, owes um, a bank $10 million. And uh, I'm a multi-millionaire. And I'll call out a friend of mine back here, Rick Meisel. <laughs> And, and I make out a check to the bank for $10 million. Or, or let's say cash. It's got to be cash. And I hand the cash to Rick for him to pay the bank. But instead of paying the bank, he keeps it. And every time the bank bugs, bugs Gil for, for a payment, Rick pays it. But he never gets paid off. And finally, he's in Rick's power, and he has to come to Rick and plead with him, would you make another payment, another payment? Exactly what the Catholic Church has done. This institution has taken what it calls a treasury. It has the custody of the grace of God. You never get saved. You never know for sure that you've passed from death to life. You never have eternal life. You're anathematized if you dare to say so. But you come to it for graces. And it will give you piecemeal partial payments, partial payments, partial payments. It will give you through the sacraments this partial payment of grace from this treasury that it possesses. But never do you get to Christ. Never do you know him until you finally, finally, after much effort and much time suffering and purgatory and so forth, paid this thing off. Jesus Christ, on the cross, before he died, before he gave up his spirit, he said, it is finished. Now, I don't know anything about Greek, but I know this. I'm a certified public accountant, and I know that in the Greek that's an accounting term. It means stamp the debt paid in full. It is paid in full once for all. Will you believe it? Or will you continue to be in the power of someone who says, no, we have the means of dispensing this payment bit by bit. That's basically the difference in the teaching of this church. This church here will not save you. This church doesn't claim to have the means of salvation, doesn't claim to have the means of, of dispensing graces and partial payments on eternal life. It's a body of believers who have come to know Christ. There are some distinctions and I think some real dangers, and we'll talk about them in the next hour after we have a break.